Yes, hello. Um, so today I'm going to be switching gears a little bit from the last talk. What I'm going to be focusing on is the role of neural oscillations and how they can help represent information within the human brain. So at this uh, lovely international academic conference, I'm going to start off by showing you some of my uh, holiday photos. So a couple of weeks ago, I found myself in Nepal trekking through the foothills of the Himalayas. Just going to chuck that one out there, make you all jealous. Um, it's incredibly beautiful. Uh, you get huge expanses, beautiful scenery, and this scenery has so much information. You've got some lovely snow-capped peaks, you've got wonderful forests. Um, it's incredible, it takes your breath away. And despite there being so much information, I was capable of processing all that information and understanding it within milliseconds. And now, on stage, as I tell you about all of this again, these memories come flooding back, and that information comes flooding back as well. And once again, I get to relive that experience. So somehow, the brain has an amazing mechanism to process a lot of information really quickly. What we're interested in is how the brain does this. So there's two, two ways I'm going to argue here. If you want to increase the signal um, of a particular stimulus, if you want to represent that in the brain, you either boost the quality of that signal or you reduce the noise which is masking that signal. I'm going to focus a lot more on this dropping of this background noise and how this might help represent the information. So neural oscillations, they're very prevalent within the brain, particularly alpha and beta oscillations, you see them in the neocortex everywhere. When you're idling, when you're not doing a task, you see um, a high amplitude oscillation, so these large bumps up there, which are largely thought to reflect uh, the synchrony of neurons underneath. And then when you engage in a task, you see this rapid drop off, and you can't really see an oscillation at all. Um, so one idea is um, that when all these neurons are firing together, when you're getting a large amplitude oscillation, a lot of these neurons are actually irrelevant to what's going on. These are what we call new, uh, noise correlations. Um, two neurons firing together, not representing a stimulus, essentially just makes a lot of noise, which can mask something else. So in this little schematic, we've got some red dots and we've got some blue dots. Each dot is representing, or each line is representing a neuron. These blue dots are irrelevant to the stimulus, and these red dots are relevant to the stimulus. So the red dots have got a consistent pattern. And when the blue dots are not synchronized with one another, then they can nicely represent the stimulus, whether that is perceiving the stimulus, which you've got on the left, or whether that's remembering the stimulus, which you've got on the right. When there's no background noise correlations, you're really able to um, represent that stimulus quite nicely. However, when these task-irrelevant neurons start firing together, this produces an alpha oscillation, but it also means that those three red dots are now being masked by the seven or so blue neurons who are contributing nothing to the stimulus. So we investigated the idea that perhaps desynchronized neural oscillations are beneficial for information processing by essentially reducing the background noise in the brain and helping, you, helping that um, stimulus signal be uh, presented. So what we did, we had some participants come in and take part in a simultaneous EEG fMRI experiment, and we wanted to test the hypothesis that whether decreases in alpha or beta power, which is the amplitude of this oscillation, whether that might reflect an increase in the amount of information you can represent within the neocortex. So just to give you an idea of a task, participants would first, uh, well, they were taking part in a paired associates task. They would, during encoding, they'd be presented with a video, so it's about three seconds long, and then they're presented with a word, and we'd ask them to associate the two together. Later on, they were presented with a word as a cue and asked to remember that video. And what we were expecting to see is when they're watching that video on the left in the green pane, um, we'd expect to see some representation of information within the cortex in the fMRI. We'd also expect to see this alpha-beta power decrease. So these two markers uh, have been shown a lot individually, but we haven't, no one's really considered if they interact. Similarly, during retrieval, 
When we're presented with a word, we ask them to retrieve that video. And then, once again, we're expecting to see this neural representation of a video come back and be measured with the fMRI. And we're also expecting to see an alpha beta power decrease relating to successful memory retrieval. So as a quick primer for representational similarity analysis, if you're not familiar with it, we can consider each stimulus um, in the world to, have a, to create a unique um, spatial pattern within the brain. So we've got one video here of a bike cycling down a street, and this would elicit a unique pattern. If you presented them with a, a different pattern, if you present, uh, sorry, a different stimulus, such as a watermill, which we've got on the second there, it would create a unique, different pattern. If we present them with a bike once again, we should get a very similar pattern to what we saw when we presented with them with a bike the first time. There might be some measurement noise that's never going to be perfect, but the closer the two are, the more similar you expect. The closer those two patterns are, the more similar you expect those stimuli to be. And again, if we present them with a jellyfish, which is not related to the bike at all, you get a very different pattern. And this phenomenon also extends to when you're looking at memory retrieval. So when you retrieve a video of a bike, you should see a pattern, particularly within visual cortex, which looks very similar to when you're actually watching that video. So you can almost um, decode what people are remembering based on what they saw beforehand. Um, and this is how we're going to measure information in this uh, experiment. We're going to look at how much information is unique to a particular stimulus compared to just background noise. And this will essentially tell us how much stimulus-specific information we can see on a single trial. So when we do this, what we can find is we can very nicely decode what video people are watching. Particularly within the um, occipital cortex, we get this huge red blob, um, which means which is not exactly a novel finding, we'll put that, going to be honest there, but it means we can decode what people are remembering, uh, not remembering, sorry, what people are perceiving, and very nicely in the occipital cortex, and we can get a very nice measure of information on a trial-by-trial -trial level using this approach. Similarly, when we ask people to retrieve that stimulus, we can decode what they are remembering based on the patterns we see when they are perceiving the videos. This is not so much early visual areas, but much more further down um, in the more sort of high order visual areas, particularly in the fusiform gyrus. So what we can say is, regardless of whether you're perceiving information or whether you're retrieving information, we can very nicely decode it with the fMRI. And we can use this on a trial by trial level. We then went on to alpha beta power. So this is our, again, this is the amplitude of the oscillation. And first, we just considered what happened when you're perceiving a video compared to that little window beforehand when you're staring at a fixation cross. And I'm sure, as many people who've ever done EEG are quite familiar with this result, you see a large drop in the amplitude of these uh, alpha-beta oscillations, particularly, again, in the occipital cortex. So when you're perceiving visual information, these alpha-beta oscillations drop compared to when you're not. And then we can look at memory again. And what we can find is when you successfully remember the video, you see a large drop in alpha beta power compared to when you don't remember it. Um, so if you cannot recall it, you, your brain is kind of idling. Maybe you're searching for it, but it's not there. But when you do remember it and that video comes back and you replay it in your mind, you see a lovely decrease in these alpha beta oscillations again. So these two parts are there. We know there's information in the brain when you're perceiving or retrieving information. And we know that these alpha beta power decreases uh, arise when you're um, perceiving or retrieving information. But the critical question is whether these two markers correlate. So on those trials where there's a large amount of alpha beta power decreases, is there more stimulus-specific information in that fMRI? So for each subject, what we would do, we would extract our measure of alpha beta power on a single trial. We'd extract our measure of similarity or stimulus-specific information on a given trial, and then we correlate it across trials, which would give us a correlation coefficient for each subject, explaining how well these two markers correlated with one another. And what we can find is when you are perceiving a video, we get a very nice negative correlation across subjects, which would suggest that the more information you represent within the cortex, the more information you are perceiving, the greater the desynchronization in these alpha-beta oscillations. And then we can conceptually replicate this idea during retrieval. So when you retrieve that video, when you're mentally replaying it in your head, but there's no visual perception, 
you still see the same phenomenon. You see an increase in retrieved information correlating with a uh, decrease in the alpha-beta oscillations. So there's a lot of uh, explanations of why this could be, which are less exciting than the uh, hypothesis I gave at the beginning. One could be that these, these trials where there's lots of um, a nice representation of stimulus is just correlated with a bold signal. Um, and we already know through a lot of other studies that alpha beta power decreases do correlate with an increase in bold. So we ran a partial correlation to address this potential confound, and what we find is that the activation of the bold amplitude does not influence this result at all. Similarly, during retrieval, we could can see that as, these, um, as the alpha beta power decreases, there's also an increase in confidence. So when you're more confident about what you remember, there's a greater alpha beta power decrease. And similarly, we can also see uh, in this data that as the more confident you are about what you remember, it also correlates with the amount of information which is reinstated in the cortex. So maybe this gives the explanation that it's not a correlation between information and alpha beta power, but instead it's a correlation between information and confidence, and this beta power is actually just a, a signal for confidence. So again, we ran a partial correlation uh, controlling for this confound and found that its confidence also doesn't explain the interaction we're seeing, the correlation we're seeing between information and alpha beta power. And then lastly, it could be that we're just seeing this correlation because uh, the fMRI, the representational similarity analysis, information measure, and alpha beta power, they're both just two, two sides of the same coin. They're both representing information independently. In, you can just get that measure. Um, and they just happen to correlate because one's representing information, uh, sorry, one's uh, a representational pattern and the other's a representational pattern. So we also looked at whether the alpha beta power you can decode the stimulus content. And well, using RSA again, we find that alpha beta power cannot predict what you're, either what you're perceiving, you cannot tell what video you're watching based on alpha beta power, and you cannot tell what uh, video you're remembering based on alpha beta power. So it doesn't mean that, so this correlation isn't driven by the fact that alpha beta power is just a representational pattern. Instead, it sort of would indicate that it's uh, a proxy or it uh, allows these representational patterns to come forth. Also, not on there, I forgot to add in, um, it's not pre-stimulus power as well. Um, so there's a lot of work, some very nice work into signal detection theory and also into um, baseline excitability, which would suggest that changes in that pre-stimulus alpha beta power might predict how much information you're representing in the cortex. And again, we don't find that effect during pre-stimulus alpha. It seems a very, particularly the post-stimulus alpha, after that video has come on screen. So in summary, we've got a visual perception and retrieval. For, in both cases, you can very nicely decode the stimulus content. And when you can decode the stimulus content, these windows, you can also see that there's a very nice alpha beta power decrease. What is the new bit here, the novel, exciting bit, is that these two seem to correlate on a trial by trial level. So the more your alpha beta power decreases on a given trial, the more information there appears to be within the neocortex. Um, this could be very interesting when you were now looking back at these old EEG studies. There's a lot of them who are looking at these alpha beta power decreases. It's perhaps one of the most um, common phenomenon in these EEG studies. But now we can maybe give some meaning to what's going on underneath there. And then, just to kind of discuss a uh, few extra points, um, I think some people might be very familiar with the idea that alpha, alpha oscillations relate to attention, and how does this fit in with the idea of alpha is actually reflecting information? Well, perhaps it's just two sides of the same coin. Some of the early attention uh, work would suggest that high amplitude um, alpha oscillations relate to um, a lot of gazing and, uh, a, well, a lack of attention whereas a decrease in these alpha oscillations mean you can better process, better, better attend to what's going on. This also sort of works in the same framework, um, but when you're attending to something, then you're obviously processing more information. So it's these two kind of ideas, the idea that alpha oscillations reflect attention, and these alpha oscillations reflect information, fit very, fit very nicely, really. However, some of these older stuff obviously looks at, um, almost considers it a difference in state. So there's a high amplitude oscillation state where you're not attending to stuff. There's a low amplitude oscillation state where you can attend to stuff. We show it's not so much a binary distinction as it is a sort of parametric 
uh, change. So the more that you desynchronize, the more information you can process. And then lastly, we've also been focused I've focused solely on the, uh, alpha and beta here, ignoring the sort of the slower theta oscillations and the higher frequency gamma oscillations, both of which have also been related to information processing. Um, I'm not going to say here that these two frequencies, the theta and gamma, are not related to information processing. That's not what I'm here to do. Um, I'm going to say actually that I think they are related to information processing, but in a different manner. So when I started the talk, I talked about two methods to represent information. Um, sorry, two ways to measure my information. Either you boost the signal or you drop the noise. So the work we've shown here might suggest that dropping the background noise helps represent information. It could be that theta and gamma are relating to boosting that signal, um, boosting the signal of the stimulus. And this is an idea which has been put forward, uh, for, for instance, through the communication via coherence theory, that synchrony within the gamma band helps represent that stimulus. So, yeah. Thanks very much for listening to me uh, blabble on about all of this. Um, thanks to my supervisor, Simon, who's put up with me for four years. Uh, thanks to Steve and Karen, who've helped a lot with setting up the EEG fMRI recordings. Xiao George, who's helped analyze some of the EEG recordings. And Jan and Maria, who have also been helping me with the fMRI analysis. And also everyone else at uh, Birmingham Uni. It's a very wonderful neuroscience community at Birmingham. So I'm just going to plug something else. We have a meeting next uh, April. So if you're interested in single units, if you're interested in hu human intracranial EEG, come along. Not only has it got the best uh, conference acronym and the best conference uh, logo, we've also got some excellent, excellent speakers and a wonderful workshop on single unit analysis. So thanks very much. <laughs> you're right, but... <laughs> We'll just go one very quick question, but then we have to keep moving. All right. Well, uh, you should just go right up. And, go ahead. Yeah, very nice talk. Thanks so much. Uh, did you observe in this study uh, what has been observed, I think, in previous studies by Simon and yeah. colleagues, that you could predict individual performance based on these decreases or how power correlates with how well the subject did, and maybe you can correlate that with how efficiently information was processed Yes, uh, so, through, yeah. through your new measures. Did you observe that as well? I yes, guess? yes, we definitely did. So we saw a decrease in these alpha power where, when you remembered something. So those trials where people could remember the stimulus, you see a decrease in alpha beta power. Um, when they didn't remember something, there's an increase. Well, not necessarily an increase, but a relatively higher power. But did you have a measure of performance, how well each subject individually could do was, in the uh, task? Or? And would this correlate with these power decreases, like a I marker of performance? It, but yeah, it? as in the, the, um, you correlate it across subjects. Across subjects, yeah. I hadn't thought about it, but it's like mm. a very interesting point to check I think, in. Yeah, Simon has done very beautiful work before. Yeah. That. So maybe, you, and that would be interesting to correlate with your other fMRI analysis, in terms of coefficient, yeah. each individual subject process information. Ah, yes, yeah. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, good. Thanks. All right, let's thank the speaker one last time. <laughs>